Hi everybody, it's Dr. Galvin with today's coronavirus update. It's Monday, March 23rd. Um, as usual, we'll talk a bit about the numbers. Um, currently, as of when I just checked a few minutes ago, um, there's 35,000 cases in the U.S., uh, 470 deaths. Um, interestingly, 1.3% mortality rate. You know, worldwide right now, there's about 350,000 cases and it's about a 4.3% mortality rate. In Italy, it's a 9% mortality rate. So why our mortality rate in the U.S. is so low, I'm not quite sure. It may be that these things that we've implemented quickly, especially cutting off travel from other countries, may have really had a significant effect and we've been able to get ahead of the curve a little bit. I don't really know what the answer is. I don't know if those numbers will hold out. It may be that we just are seeing such low numbers because we are so early in the phases of this and we may not know as much. But our numbers are looking you know, very similar to South Korea as, a, as opposed to Italy. You know, Spain, I believe, has got you know, about a 3% mortality rate. Um, New York has got the most cases, 16,000. And even there, with a lot of cases, the mortality rate is 0.9%. Here in North Carolina today, we have 311 cases. So far, no deaths. So um, that's good. Today, I thought I'd take a little time to go through some of the questions people have left me um, on the comments. There's quite a few of them. If I missed your question, I apologize. I've got notes today because I, I normally take these things to my light and it's hard for me to see them. So I've gotten a lot of questions about reinfection. If you've had it once, can you get it again? Um, are you immune completely? Well, you know, we don't know for sure. We're hoping that that's the case. We've talked about using some of these ideas of convalescent serum as a, um, as a possible treatment. You know, we have a lot of other types of coronaviruses that cause things like common colds, and we develop partial immunity, but we seem to get it again seasonally. We think the virus can mutate. It may be like the flu in that case. It may be that we end up having to get a coronavirus vaccine every year that gets updated slightly. But there's some primate studies that have been done that showed inability to get reinfected. There have not been many case reports of the you know, 350,000 people that have had the virus so far. There are not many case reports of anybody becoming reinfected. So hopefully we can assume that if you get this infection, then you're gonna at least be immune in the short time, in the short term. We think that sometimes these immunities don't last. And we looked at SARS and MERS, the two other big dangerous coronavirus um, infections that have happened. And they burned out quickly because of very tight controls in terms of contact controls and isolation and quarantine that knocked it out. But they've gone back and looked at people that survived those uh, viruses and they still got antibodies a couple years later. So there's a possibility there may be some long-term immunity, but the virus will likely mutate and may come back seasonally and you may have to get a booster immunization every year. Um, I think that the other one I've been getting a lot of is, you know, I, I was sick in December with these exact same symptoms. Did I have it? Or my kid had this. Well, you know, remember that the symptoms of this, cough, fever, malaise, fits the differential for many, many, many things. And the winter time is the time that most of these sort of viral illnesses occur. So just because you had fever and cough in December does not mean you had this virus. The first documented case in the US, I believe was January 20th. If it was in the wild, in December, given the rate of propagation and transmission, we would have millions of cases by now. So I think it's highly unlikely that anybody that got sick in December or October or even early January had this. So I wouldn't assume uh, any way that you're immune. In terms of testing people for uh, immunity, um, I'm not sure exactly if that's available yet. I think that more liberal testing is going to uh, be available, especially in the next couple of weeks, and faster testing. You know, right now in our hospital, tests are still coming back three or four days later. The rapid tests are probably not going to be online for another week or so. Um, asymptomatic shedding of the virus. I think I've gotten a lot of questions about that. What does that mean? Well, there's a fair amount of evidence that people can actually have virus in their in their sputum, in their in their saliva, um, in their secretions three to four days before they develop any symptoms. And so if that's the case, if you happen to sneeze or cough and those par particles fall on another surface or on somebody else and they touch their own mucous membranes, then you can potentially spread that virus. So that's a concern. It's also a concern 
with kids because we know that children are getting very, very mild symptoms. And you know, a kid with a runny nose in the wintertime, I mean, what kid doesn't have that? Um, in this case, though, it could be potentially COVID, and it could be that they are very contagious while those symptoms are going on. I've had questions about, you know, can I take my kids to see their grandparents? No, you can't. You can take them and, and keep them separated, but again, we don't know who's been exposed, and so you kind of have to have like, a, you know, in uh, that movie, you know, the circle of trust. People that, that you're around you are, have got to be kind of known to be kind of clean for the last period of time. Um, you know, if you, what you don't want to do is expose an older person to um, your child if there's any chance at all that they could be a carrier. I don't know if, um, you know, as, as testing becomes more and more available, if, you're, if you can get your child tested and they're negative and, and you keep them isolated, then, you know, I think that would be fairly clear that they can't transmit it as long as they're going to get exposed to other kids. But that'll happen, you know, uh, as time goes on. The other thing um, has been questions about warm weather. You know, will warm weather cause this virus to go away? And again, I don't think we know. We think that humidity has a, a role to play and, and lower levels of humidity like you have in the winter make it a little bit easier to transmit. Seasonality of this virus, we don't know. Um, certainly when it's hot outside, it may be less amenable to the virus living for any period of time um, on surfaces, but we don't really know. At this point, there's no clear evidence that the warm weather is going to make this virus go away. Remember, there's a natural progression of these things. They have a logarithmic growth, they go up really, really fast, and then everyone's either infected or dies, and then it drops because it runs out of hosts. So we're trying to lower that curve to preserve the healthcare system, and that's why we're implementing all of these restrictions. Um, some other uh, questions I had were about um, is takeout safe? Well, I think takeout safe, as long as you're, you know, you're, you're careful. I think most restaurants are having their people use gloves. You know, we really need to support local businesses. It's absolutely essential if we're gonna survive this economically. So I think the takeout is fine. Somebody says, is it safe to go to the ER? Well, I think I've addressed this numerous times. No, it's not safe to go to the ER unless you're really, really sick. So if it's a minor problem, pick up the phone and call. There are plenty of hotlines available now that you can run your symptoms by and talk to a nurse or somebody similar and they can sort of direct you. But if you've just got some minor thing that, you know, it, you, you know, that's not a life or death emergency, then going to the emergency room is gonna just expose you to people that potentially are sick or if you've got it, you're gonna expose others. So certainly if you're ill or you're injured, then you need to go to the emergency department. But if you're not sure, and, and usually that's the clue, if, if it's an emergency or not. If you're not sure, then it probably isn't an emergency, and it's worthwhile to make that phone call to your primary care doctor, to one of these nurse lines that the hospital systems are set up, even call the emergency department directly to get some guidance, because many things can be treated you know, via telehealth. We're offering it here in this office. If you've got a medical problem, we can call up, set up an appointment, and I'll, I'll talk to our patients via video. Um, but you know, don't just go to the ER for you know, a stubbed toe. Um, how can you tell the difference between a regular virus and COVID? You can't. Remember, many, many things present with fever, cough, malaise. The only way to really determine which is which is to test, and as testing becomes more broadly available, that will become a bigger, uh, easier to do. Um, I've had some questions about the, the, the treatment and subsequent shortages of things like Plaquenil. You know, people that have lupus, use Plaquenil or hydroxychloroquine for, to keep their lupus in remission. And we've got people that are apparently hoarding Plaquenil that don't even have any type of disease just in case they get it. That's a horrible thing. These people that have lupus absolutely need these medicines. Production is going to be ramping up quite a bit. We just had a treatment protocol come out in our hospital where we're using a combination of hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin for the sicker patients that have uh, COVID. Um, there are some antiviral combos um, that are potentially being used in an experimental drug called remdesivir that we're trialing as well. There are clinical trials going on all over this country and in other countries to see if those are reasonable treatment algorithms. But those treatments are just people that, are, you know, that small percentage that get really, really, really sick. Um, vitamins for prevention, I think that goes back to sort of just health and wellness. I think if you're eating well, if you're sleeping well, if you're exercising, you're gonna boost your immune system. Do multivitamins help boost your immune system? They can't hurt. I mean, let's be honest, most multivitamins end up 
you know, coming out as urine because you don't absorb uh, most of that. I think if you're eating good quality food, you're going to get plenty of vitamins and minerals that you need. Um, I think it's important to be eating, you know, leafy greens and getting sort of prebiotics and, and some fermented foods as well because we want to make our gut biome healthy and, and happy as well because it's going to help our immune system as well. Um, I'm going to sign off from now. I'm working in the emergency department tonight. It's uh, like 1 o'clock. I'm going to get out of this office in a couple hours, go home and take a nap, and then go to the emergency department from 8 to 6 tonight, 6 a.m. tomorrow. Um, tomorrow, I'll come back with an update on the state of things on the ground in the emergency department. So everybody, as usual, wash your hands, take care of yourself, take care of your families, take care of everybody else, and I'll talk to you tomorrow.